And now uh, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce uh, the president of the Revolutionary Students Union who has done so much to advance many of those struggles. Um, so please uh, begin by giving a warm hand uh, to Sarah Simmons, uh, who will be presenting a workshop on mass organizing. Thank you. Am I good, Jacob? Yeah, you are good. Okay. Um, so first, the first question I want to address is what is mass organizing? Um, so mass organizing is a lot more than um, flyering a thousand houses. It's a lot more than having a protest. It's a lot more than even having a panel. Mass organizing revolves around a mass organization. Um, and mass organizing is about what's practical and not necessarily what's the theoretically correct for um, like definitely applied like uh, to revolutionary theory. So though revolutionary theory is important, I'm not I don't want to discredit that. Um, I just want to emphasize that mass organization is a practical um, application. Um, so I've kind of organized this in, as you can see, um, a few different points. Um, starting with struggle. Um, because basically all mass organizing comes down to struggle. Um, you'll see here I've listed struggle, um, alone versus collective mass organization. And what this, what I'm implying here is um, what we strive to do is win people to struggle. And struggle is <laughs> not attending a protest. Struggle is not um, like passing out flyers. Struggle is recognizing uh, intrinsic flaws and contradictions within society and within the capitalist system. Um, and so, like I said, what we strive to do is win people to this recognition of struggle. Um, and once you've won a person to struggle, um, obviously, I've, we've probably all been here as revolutionaries, is you kind of have this like um, conscious enlightening where you're like, oh, wow, Capitalism sucks, or oh wow, racism is terrible. Like, what do I do about it? And that's where um, a mass organization comes into play, okay? Because obviously, um, it's uh, a collective organization is a lot more effective than an individual. So um, once you've recognized struggle, once you've accepted struggle, and once you um, are interested in advancing struggle. Um, it's about collective or finding a collective group, um, which in turn is a mass organization. And a mass or a collective group is not necessarily a mass organization because a collective group could be a bunch of people that get together on the weekend and talk about um, gay rights or talk about anything really political and theoretical, but aren't necessarily um, like putting this into practical um, experience. So. That's where mass organization comes into. Um, and also, um, a mass organization is not necessarily about getting a lot of people. Um, and mass, or mass organizing is not about the number of people you have. So it's not about how many people you have at your rally. It's not about how many people you have at your meetings every night. Um, it's about how many people you have that are dedicated to struggle. Um, and how many people you have that are interested in advancing your cause. Um, a mass organization uh, fulfills the interests of the people within the organization. Um, for example, a student group fulfills student interests. Um, or an anti-war group fulfills the interests of the anti-war com community. Um, so when you create a mass organization and when you're mass organizing, you have to um, look at the needs, goals, and principles of those you're winning to struggle. Um, so the people that you're looking to draw, and also, as I have down here, the goals and principles of the people within, within the group. Um, and what I want to really emphasize within uh, winning people to struggle in mass organization is that this is not promoting awareness. We do not give two shits about promoting awareness. Um, promoting awareness is ineffective, a waste of everybody's time, and also really does not advance struggle. Like, it 
principally does not advance struggle. Doesn't matter if you, some guy didn't know that there was apartheid in Israel, okay? Oh, wow, there's apartheid in Israel, and goes on with his day. No, that's not what we want. We want some guy to recognize apartheid in Israel and be mobilized and want to do something about apartheid in Israel. Um, and then, um, within a mass organization, um, and within struggle, we want to be aware of entryism. So, um, entryism, I have the exact definition somewhere here. Um, essentially, what entryism is, is uh, not rec like when you recruit a bunch of, um, like you recruit people from other organizations, the best people from other organizations, to try to better your organization. Or you go into an organization being like, well, I'm gonna go into this student organization and I'm gonna make them do like immigrant work and I'm gonna convert them all to doing uh, like immigrant work. No, a mass organization must be focused and have uh, um, objectives. And going into that organization, you have to kind of abide and advance those objectives instead of trying to promote your own or bringing in other people um, thinking that they are going to, like, they, with all their separate issues, are going to promote your, your group. Um, it's important that when you have a mass organization, uh, the people, like I said, within your group are interested in advancing your group um, and its causes and not trying to change those. Um, so I'm going to kind of re-go over goals and principles of those you're winning to struggle. Um, so in a case like this where we're an anti-capitalist group, um, the goals and principles of those are win you're winning to struggle are those um, that you're fighting for, essentially. What, what do working class students want? You know, cheaper or better tuition, or lower tuition, I don't know, better t tuition is a little subjective, but lower tuition. Um, undocumented students want the ability to go to school without having to pay at the ads. Um, and, or in the case of anti-war, um, I mean, if you're anti-war, then you want, obviously, to do, um, like, oppose wars and, you know, get involved in that, in that way. So you have to recognize what, like, who you're winning, and then what their goals and what they believe in. And in that way, you can um, either point out contradictions or emphasize contradictions and educate and hopefully win them to struggle. Um, Let's see. Oh yeah. So um, oh, and it, I, for me, and I think uh, this is true um, with what I've experienced. Um, it's you usually don't uh, bring people into the mass organization. Just anybody bring them into the mass organization and then um, convert them to struggle. Um, if you're trying to promote your organization or uh, build your mass organization, um, you, pr you um, commit people to struggle and then uh, bring them into your organization. Um, so kind of on that, Greg. Oh, I was just going to say, so when you say to commit them to struggle, do you have some personal experiences that would be related to that? Um, why, yes. So, um... Really, like what we've seen, I'll just give the example of the Palestine um, movement because that's what I've been most involved in recently. Um, so, like through these protests that we've had for Palestine, um, a lot of people have come in and been um, basically solely uh, against Israel and pro-Palestine um, without really any general direction or um, kind of conscious consciousness um, to struggle, or to the fact that, you know, um, it's an imperialist conflict, it's, it's all these other things based on more than just a, you know, a religious feud or, um, like, some current political um, fight. Like, this is, the Israel-Palestine um, circumstance, or situation is kind of quintessential, like, to so much deeper and, um, like, struggle, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so we've had a lot of these people come into uh, the protests like, yeah, no, like, screw Israel and go Palestine. And then 
um, as we've talked to them and as <coughs> they continue to come to these protests, um, we've been able to talk, like, just kind of chat with them and kind of um, not necessarily um, be propagandist, but, like, uh, point out that it is, like, a deeper imperialist conflict. It is a uh, outcome of capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And by doing that, um, these people become more, I mean, less, yeah, it's a shame that Israel is killing all of these kids <coughs> for the past four weeks, and more like, oh, wow, this is actually a much deeper conflict, and it's not, I mean, it's similar to all, so all, a lot of other ones within the Middle East and all over the world. Um, and that would be an example of winning to struggle. Um, so yeah, good question. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, before I move on to organization, um, I just kind of wanted to have... Um, oh, well, I, I just kind of wanted to have everybody um, kind of get into groups and maybe discuss um, like, what like what struggle means, um, how you would uh, kind of mobilize people into accepting and recognizing struggle, um, and then what, uh, like why you wouldn't just want to promote awareness. So what are the benefits of struggle? How would you get people there? And then why don't you just want to promote awareness? So let's see how many people do we have here. 19. 19. Um, so maybe like groups of four. Um, like it doesn't have to be exactly four. But if you like, maybe you guys against the wall, you guys against the wall. Hey, no. um, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's against the wall, not off against the wall. <laughs> um, then like <coughs> you, well, you four and then you five. Is that okay? Alright, so we'll just get into groups and kind of discuss that. Um, okay, um, so if we could, I want to kind of go through each group and kind of summarize what you guys were talking about. Um, so we'll start with you guys. Uh, no, man, you, you have the most to say. Go ahead, what's their summation? Uh, Sorry, put you on the spot. I mean, we were just going all over the place, but I guess uh, just just that, uh, you know, what what does it you know, mean to, to be part of a struggle to take it you know beyond just you know wanting to go from one place to another, but to to, to push someone to, to actually want to make a difference, to change where they're at, to to, to make a better world, <laughs> um, and you know going going beyond you know both recognizing the practical you know like we were talking about the conflict in Pal Palestine Israel you know what can we what the protests what difference those protests make does it actually change things what does that change mean and thinking through that you know struggle means being practical you know saying well this is what difference we can make this is how we can make that difference certainly I would pose a question to you um, would you say that like recognizing and acknowledging struggle um, can you recognize and acknowledge struggle on one particular issue, or is the recognition and acknowledgement of struggle um, like the recognition and acknowledgement of a systemic problem? Um, like, what what is it to you? I'm not necessarily looking for like a right or wrong answer, but I'm wondering what you think. I would argue the second, the systemic. But you okay. know, you gotta. I mean, you recognize individual struggles, but then try and when you when you try and radicalize to to, to bring to their uh, their attention, the fact this is part of a flawed system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Instead of just one issue, this is, yeah. this is because the system is bad, not just because there are a few you know, bad apples, because the barrel is rotten, you know? I would certainly agree with that. I would say struggle is um, recognizing and continually, um, like continually trying to advance struggle. So it's not just, like I said earlier, attending a protest um, for the Palestinian struggle, it's, you know, um, opposing imperialism on all fronts, not necessarily just in between Israel and Palestine. Or, you know, Chris? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Lauren, right? Yes. Um, but, you know, you talked about your campaign with the DREAM Act, there, right? and you repeat a call, maybe you want to kind of share that for a second, just because you said a lot of people got disillusioned. Um, sure, uh, we, uh, 
we had uh, campaigns that were directed towards senators and uh, congressmen here at the U, here at Utah, and for the DREAM Act and for migrant rights and immigration reform and the fact that they were so unresponsive and unwilling to work with us uh, led to a lot of disillusionment among followers of the group and the group itself that's it's dwindled so it's sort of led to a reorganization of what our priorities are in terms of like community organizing and who our targets are going to be which is no longer the politicians. But would you say there's a general consensus among the people you're working with that the, that one these senators don't care about us that it's going to require alternate methods rather than going through legal channels that are, you know, what we're told we can do with our democratic representatives. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it led us to a more radical perspective as a group to want to uh, focus our energies towards community campaigns and mobilization of our communities as opposed to begging the politicians for scraps. Certainly. That's really, really good. Um, do you guys want to kind of give somebody from your group kind of give a summary of what you guys talked about? Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, we, we were talking about like protests and how you were saying that uh, the people that you've talked to at protests over you know, the three or four that we've had so far that people keep showing up and that those are the people you focus on, but that their kind of awareness, their consciousness changes gradually, and it's because of them being asked questions, and we were talking about, um, I guess, like, the difference between information and, like, an understanding of a situation, and also how you, how people sort of already know, like, that something's screwed up and that they don't need to be educated in this, like, grand way, they just sort of need to be, one of, one of us said, we need to just kind of push people continually um, to kind of show up to more things and to, and to think through things, like, harder, and that they'll, they're going to come to an understanding of the situation that's much more subtle than you're going to be able to give them just by like shouting at them like this is what's fucked up you know so I guess that's sort of that's part of what we talked about so like educating um, those like pushing them to struggle essentially yeah and, and pushing the people that that are like uh, that show the most ability and like the most will to like show up and do things and like that seem to care the most like you don't Say okay, well these people are done now. Yeah. And, and we're we're just gonna work on these other people. You just keep you keep going like, as much as you can. I guess that's so focusing your efforts on those who seem like they might be readily one to struggle, um, and then not just like and continually focusing your efforts on that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, do you guys? Okay. So, um, you know, we talked about what struggle was, like how you win people to struggle, um, how you build struggle, and like, uh, the, like I think the big thing that we've all kind of agreed on was like, um, the, you know, the really important thing is to like take a, you know, what we like from like, hey, we hate capitalism, or hey, we hate apartheid, and you break that problem down into like, you know, smaller consumable chunks, like, hey, we can do a boycott, divestment, sanctions, action here, we can do a protest here, we can achieve this small goal, um, and like, you know, yeah, I, I think that I think that was like the main <laughs> summary of like what most of us were saying. Did I leave anything out? I believe the, the rest of it is on that page. Right? Yeah, I mean that's nailed yeah. it. Okay. So nailed it. I, I just I'm, I put this up here because I heard Ian say it, and I completely agree, and I think it co totally represents this entire um, that um, you don't build struggle through education; you educate the people by building struggle. So anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there. Do you guys have anything, I mean, I know Lauren are, or already spoke, but maybe do you have a, anything else to share about what you talked about? I never heard it articulated as like building struggle, but I guess what we're talking about is like mobilizing people who are being, who are like struggling as it were, like people who are being affected by certain things yeah. to be the ones to stand up and like ask for change. So I guess like who, you're directed towards is people who are directly yeah. needing, needing the change the most. Certainly, which is exactly what I was trying to convey with the goals and principles of those you're winning to struggle. Like obviously, those you're winning to struggle are the ones who are most affected by struggle. Whether that be an immigrant struggle, a student struggle, a Palestinian struggle, 
um, an anti-war struggle. Um, as a NAS organization, you need to recognize what the goals and what the principles of those people are, and then address your NAS organization towards those people. Um, so, yeah, I, basically you guys covered it. I feel like that was um, really good. Um, next would be organization. So this is kind of um, like the bread and butter of, I would say, your, uh, your mass organization, such as this. Um, and first, I'll just, because since we were just talking about it with you guys, you, the universal resides in the particular. Um, so we don't build, and I think this is key in a mass organization, you do not build a campaign around an ab abstract concept, such as racism or uh, immigrant rights or um, anti-imperialism, okay? Because, well, I mean, honestly, when it comes down to it, what good would a racism protest do? Um, and that's where you try to focus on particular events um, or particular issues, such as, um, like recently, the Multicultural Department of SLCC, which they got rid of. And so, um, all, I mean, all student organizations kind of grouped together and fought that, and the multicultural department has been reinstated. But instead of just being like, wow, screw racism, or, uh, you know, screw um, students who are people of color, it's like, no, screw getting rid of the, the school um, administration for getting rid of the multicultural department, which offers a lot of benefits and programs for these people. So. Um, I think that, Chris. Yeah, one of the examples I gave in our group, um, so we did a lot of Colombian solidarity at UVU at one point, and that's an example of capitalist exploitation. Yeah. The better results we got were with dealing with funding for students at UVU, which is again another example of capitalist exploitation, right, as the abstract general universal principle. Yeah. But when it's implied in the particular example as you're alluding to, right, people are receptive to things that are in their immediate reality. Right, that concretely affect them. I'm not receiving enough funding compared to other students in the state. So yeah, definitely. rather than you know, there's a peace negotiator being detained by the Department of Homeland Security, and his trial was bogus. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. like you said, it's. I mean, if you don't really have um, like a personal connection, or really, it's not like it doesn't address you or your goals and principles. Um, then, I mean, yeah, it's great to have. Uh, like it's great to have a movement trying to, you know, um, work around that or work around, or, you know, con uh, abstract concepts, like I said, such as racism, but they're not necessarily going to be effective, and you almost border on this uh, issue of awareness. And like, um, can any anybody give me an answer at, or their opinion on why raising awareness isn't like what a mass organization should attempt to do? Anybody? Adrian? Because whether or not you put the information, or if you put the information out there, it's up to them as to whether or not they actually care enough to read it. And yeah. most people don't. Most people, you post something, you you know, anywhere, and they just kind of skim by it. Yeah, it's like that quintessential, you see somebody post something like terrible on Facebook, like, oh, some video of some Palestinian mother holding her dead child. And yeah, that like really affects me, and it's really sad. But also, that doesn't like necessarily mobilize me. Um, it just makes me aware that they're killing Palestinian children, which is terrible, and I hate it. But like, that's not actively mobilizing people to um, the struggle. It's passive. Yeah, exactly. Essentially, awareness is passive, and what mass organization aims to do is the active. Exactly. Um, did you have your hand up? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, the universal resides in the particular. Um, as a mass organization, we must strive to um, find particular events, particular uh, like points in time. So for example, with these Palestine ra rallies, we actually, I mean, um, it made sense to have these Palestine uh, <coughs> rallies because of the current <coughs> occupation of Gaza. Um, for the past four weeks, which has been particularly brutal. So because of that, it made it a particularly good time to mobilize people for the struggle of Palestine. 
Um, it's, I mean, it's not like this hasn't been going on for a really long time. I mean, always um, in Israeli apartheid is having effect on Palestinian citizens. But recently, between I mean, the occupation and the deaths, um, we've had a lot more success than we have in the past when we've tried to organize uh, for Palestine. Um, so that's kind of using a particular event or um, something in the fa in favor of your event. <coughs> People usually only will react to something that they're highly passionate about. I mean, I've noticed that a lot. So, I mean, to, uh, like with this whole uh, this Palestine right now, which support uh, solidarity movement that we're doing. Um, it seems like a lot of people that are directly affected by it will be the ones that will actually attend and you know mobilize for it. Um, but to raise awareness to others um, who may not be would also, I mean, people may have passion about something, but it's another to have a people that are passionate about it, drive others crazy about it until they want to know what's going on. Yeah, that's kind of like how I was talking about earlier. You identify the people that might uh, readily accept struggle and recognize it, and then try to push those people in the right direction through education, through, um, you know, just constant, like what we've been doing is like constant rallying, etc. cetera. Um, and I'd like to point out that it is the job of the mass organization and of the leadership within the mass organization um, to theoretically identify uh, the universal within particulars or to find a particular that you can um, identify with your universal. So as a student organization um, and as a student, an anti-capitalist student organization, we're um, finding, like this education for all, we're finding particular instances that we can rally around where we can be successful um, instead of just kind of combating um, general concepts. Because, um, I mean, like abstract knowledge is great, and abstract knowledge, I mean, we should all strive to have be theoretically advanced, but what really matters is applying that to uh, concrete actions. Um, and that's where you kind of get this active, focused, and dedicated. Um, as a mass organization, um, we really try to remain active because it's great if we meet every week and have these lectures, um, but we're not actually accomplishing every, anything if we're not constantly looking for um, ways to get involved and ways to promote struggle, which is kind of the um, core of everything. So as a mass organization, you must strive to be active, especially because, I mean, and what if you don't, uh, you kind of lose credibility as a mass organization. Like the point of a mass organization is to organize. And if you just meet weekly and have lectures about um, Marxist theory, that's awesome, but you're not actually putting that into anything. Um, and then once you have uh, created something to put your efforts towards, for example, education for all, anti-war committee, you have to remain focused on this. So it's not something where you can be like, yeah, education all for all for two weeks. Um, you kind of have to be, be able to focus, and this is not only focus as a group, but focus as individuals who are working on tasks. Um, focus on your tasks and ensure that they're completed. And um, I just kind of, before I get to dedicated, um, this is kind of where your leadership plays in. So um, leadership doesn't necessarily mean the person that's running everything and saying, like making all the decisions. Especially in this organization where we are democratic, um, uh, decisions are made collectively. However, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have a leader. Like, for example, on the Palestine issue, yes, I've been I've been leader, but that doesn't mean that I'm doing everything. It means that I'm uh, assigning tasks. It means that I'm ensuring that they've been completed, and then it means that I'm um, assuming responsibility and also ensuring responsibility among people that have tasks. So, and that's where the fo focus comes in. And I think it's uh, in a mass organization, it's kind of the duty um, of the leader to kind of ensure that everybody is remaining focused. But if you're dedicated to struggle, then ideally, like this is, means continual focus on uh, issues that relate to that. 
Um, and then there's dedicated, and dedicated is kind of obvious. Um, we ha if we're going to start an education for all campaign, we have to be dedicated to uh, get results, and we have to be dedicated to see through our demands. So, and this is kind of, um, like I would say, um, if you're, dedicated means not necessarily accepting compromise or not, um, like if you have a set of demands that you ensure that those are met to the fullest degree. And I think it's important too, um, with the mass organization, that like you recognize that some, some struggles will be won and some won't. Um, you just want to make sure that they're not lost because of a lack of focus, a lack of dedication, or a lack of activity. Um, so yeah, some campaigns are going to fall through, but as long as they don't necessarily fall through um, because of the organization's inability to like run effectively. Um, and then we kind of already talked about concrete campaigns, but I think it's really, really important um, in mass organizing to build concrete campaigns um, based on particulars um, with subtle uh, universal subtext. So every particular event or campaign you have has some sort of universal uh, subtext. Like exact, for example, Education for All obviously has a immigrant rights and um, immigrant rights subtext. Um, and then the advanced, intermediate, and backward. Um, so what we mean by the advanced, intermediate, and backward. Um, so before I, I mean, before I talk about the advanced, intermediate, and backward, I kind of want to preface it by saying that this is not necessarily, like when you say advanced, advanced intermediate, um, and backward, uh, or when you apply that term to somebody, it's not necessarily a moral judgment. So, um, it, it's not necessarily like, if you're an advanced, that doesn't necessarily mean you're the shit. If you're a backward, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. Um, so, sorry, let me get. So the advanced. Um, as you would probably guess, the advanced are the most active and the most dedicated um, people within a, uh, within a struggle. Um, and in a campaign or in a, within a mass organization, it's important to identify the advance and unite the advance. And can anybody tell me why it would be most beneficial to unite the most uh, dedicated and active people in a campaign? Well, You're gonna make sure. things happen. Yeah, exactly. Do you want to add anything to that? Just that. Exactly. They make they make things happen. The advance are the core of a, of the struggle. Um, and to the advance, you have to give or designate definite, um, definite and clear tasks. So, for example, um, you might give. Let's see. Um, I mean, an advanced person would lead education for all, or an advanced person like kind of takes full, um, control of a campaign or does things like contact uh, other organizations, try to build um, communications, etc. cetera. Um, so you give the advance the most, uh, not necessarily the most important tasks, but kind of the most vital. And obviously I'm making a distinction between vital and important. Um, so yeah, it is, um, you want to identify and unite the advance in a campaign. So the intermediate. Um, let's see, the intermediate are basically uh, the general populace. Um, so, for at, at a, let's say at, we're at a Palestine uh, rally, um, the advance would be the people that are handing out resume order flyers or, you know, screaming um, chants or um, come with like all their posters and an intimate knowledge of the Palestinian Israeli conflict and the acknowledgement of struggle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas the intermediate are the people that come and kind of like stand at the back or stand and just kind of hold hold their poster. Whereas they care, um, but they're not necessarily on the front lines fighting. 
Um, and it's important, and they're usually not, uh, they don't necessarily feel as strongly um, about the campaign. Um, so it's somebody that might be like, yeah, Palestine, like, free Palestine, but we don't really like Hamas, and we don't support, like, the Palestinian government. Um, so where they support, they support the campaign, but they're not necessarily advancing it. Um, and with the intermediate, it's important that you don't try to uh, guilt them or, like, drive them into struggle. Ideally, with the intermediate, you educate and raise them into an advanced. Um, but you're obviously not going to do that by being like, wow, you're a terrible person for not caring about Palestine or not knowing like the details of the conflict or blah, blah, blah. Um, you just educate them. You uh, give them the appropriate information and then try to kind of cultivate um, that them, like Kyle was saying, Kyle's group was saying earlier, is you kind of identify them and then kind of just try to nudge them along until they accept struggle and um, they want to de dedicate themselves to struggle. Um, and it's important, I, before I continue, I just want to say that the advanced, intermediate, and backward are not necessarily the same people at, in every campaign. Some person might be super advanced in a Palestinian, I mean, in the Palestinian campaign, and might be completely backward on immigrant rights or uh, even other anti-war work or other other things. So I'm not necessarily like these are not necessarily the same people all the time. And part of um, a mass organization is within each campaign identifying who they are and uh, carrying out through there. So let's say like. Let's say Canon is really awesome um, for education and all, and really backward um, for the Palestine uh, for the Palestine campaign. So in education for all, I'd be like, yeah, Canon, you do like you do this. Contact representatives, do research, do this, this, and this. And then the Palestine uh, campaign, I'd be like, yeah, Canon, hold that sign, and you know honk your horn when you drive by. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that we're kicking Cannon out, um, but it is, it, we are trying to mm, keep him constrained. That's not, not, not obviously not letting him do the talking, not letting him go up to people in the street and be like, yeah, Palestine, because as a backward person, um, he might not necessarily be the best person to recruit to a campaign. So, and, but in education for all, maybe he's the best person to, to do that. So within each campaign, you uh, identify these people. Greg? A really great example of this would be the Roman Catholic Church. Absolutely wonderful on uh, the question of uh, execution. Absolutely wonderful on the question of immigration. Absolutely wonderful on the question of anti-war. Absolutely terrible on women's rights and like LGBTQ rights. Um, so the Roman Catholic Church is the perfect person or group to ask to speak at like an immigration rally, and it's like the worst group uh, to ask uh, for women, uh, you know, to speak at a women's reproductive rights, you know, rally. <laughs> Can you imagine someone asking the uh, Catholic Church to speak at like a, you know, reproductive a pro rights rally? rally? Yeah, pro-choice rally. <laughs> So that kind of like, yeah, I just thought that would be a Definitely, no, that's a, that's a great example. Um, so, unite the advanced, mobilize the intermediate. So try to cultivate them, try to raise them to advance, um, and try to get them organizing. Um, and I think it's important here um, to, um, actually, I want to take that back. You don't necessarily want them organizing, but you do want to give them tasks within an organization. And the reason you wouldn't want an intermediate person organizing is because they're perhaps not dedicated enough or focused enough to the struggle to organize effectively. So you want to be like, yeah, why don't you, like, I don't know, this is, the, if I say this, it doesn't necessarily mean I've, like, 
put you as an intermediate, but why, why don't you go pass out flyers? Like for all, the Palestine rally, a lot of people would be like, hey, what can I do to help? And I'm not going to be like, hey, yeah, do you want to speak for 10 minutes at this rally? Um, but I will be like, hey, yeah, do you want to pass out 50 flyers around the city? Um, so, like, I'm not necessarily um, shutting them out. I am trying to, like, mobilize them and try to get them active and try to, to get them with, uh, involved, but um, I'm also not going to give them any tasks that might require that, like, deep knowledge of theory or anything like that. So you want to mobilize the intermediate, and with, while you're mobilizing, kind of um, uh, think about who you can raise to advance. Um, and then there's the backward. Um, and like I said, this isn't like a moral judgment. If like you're a backward person, that doesn't mean you're a terrible person. Um, the backward, um, backward are just generally, it would be like, for example, um, I don't know if any of you attended the second Palestine rally, but there was um, some guy from some of one, a Jewish organization there. And he was like, yeah, I support Palestine, but also I like Israel and Zionism, and like that's an example of a backward person. Um, yeah, they're at the rally, and yeah, they might not, I mean, they might not support um, killing Palestinians, but they're also not for your movement in any way. Like, you don't want to give the Zionist person um, the megaphone. Yeah, the megaphone or really um, any tasks. And like I said earlier, you kind of want to isolate that person and be like, great, awesome that you don't support the killing of Palestinians. Why don't you go hold a sign over there and like act on that? Yes, yeah, exactly. So once again, you're not necessarily shutting them out or telling them to get out, um, though that might be necessary in some cases. Um, for example, if they're like, yeah, screw Palestine. Israel has every right to invade and kill Palestinian, Palestinian ch children, then you're like, yeah, get out and don't be involved in our movement. Yeah. This kind of reminds me, uh, at the last rally, there were some Palestinian guys who were like, oh, well, if you don't support Palestine, I'm going to kick your ass. And like for the people that wouldn't honk, they'd be like making racist comments about them. They're like, oh, yeah, fuck them. Yeah. That would, I, be a I would characterize that as backwards, wouldn't you? <laughs> Greg? Yeah, and just kind of building off that a little bit. Sometimes it's their methods. Like the student was totally pro-Palestine. And then he had like a giant swastika flag and was like, <laughs> Israel is Nazi. Or, and then the, I've seen like Netanyahu is Hitler. Yeah. Um, you know, like love the enthusiasm. Also, we want you to stand very close to other people in the back <laughs> so no one can see your sign. I, I, I mean, I didn't t say anything to him, but that's kind of what I thought. Because, well, I, I wouldn't want to see like a giant swastika on the, you know, the on, Also, <laughs> like, what does that do for your movement? It just makes you seem inflammatory and anta antagonistic. It's <laughs> Chris. Yeah, so the extreme one way where it's too intense, but then the extreme the other way would be you may say everything. Exactly. Right? Or you propose really just bad ideas, like, we'll vote Obama in and he'll change things. Yeah. Or why should we do that? Because that's, we're just holding signs. Right? Yeah. And the, to give an example that's not necessarily protest related, it's somebody, somebody that comes to the meeting and is like, like, where are the guns? Like, where, why aren't we discussing bombing places? And it's like, um, no, not that kind of we don't do that. And maybe you should like <laughs> go to an organization that supports that. Um, so that would be an example of a backwards person. Is someone who might, I mean, someone who doesn't necessarily reflect or want to advance your organization. And that's the thing about a mass organization is you don't have to go in and necessarily agree with every single thing. Um, obviously, that's not even possible. Um, but you don't want to be that backwards person that goes and is like, um, yeah, instead of doing that, we should do this. And if we don't do it like this, then that's not a, like, then I'm not going to support that and like this. And, you know, it's just the person that 
makes your life miserable in mass, organi mass organizing. And any of you who get involved in mass organizing will pretty easily be able to tell who that is. Um, and a lot of times it's fairly, like, it's fairly obvious. Um, so what you do with these people is you isolate them. Like with what Greg said, you give that guy a sign and then you put him in the way back and surrounded by a lot of other people with signs that don't say Netanyahu is Hitler. Um, so, and, or in the case of the person who's like, yeah, screw Palestine, you're like, please leave. Um, because that will do no good, no good for your, uh, campaign. Yeah, campaign. But I would say the majority of the backward people you meet are simply just the people, um, that are, like, that come and they don't necessarily really feel one way or the other, or, like, they're just not... They're not advancing the struggle. They're not intermediate because they're not interested in anything. They're just kind of, they're there. Just kind of there, and they're kind of antagonistic, or kind of just like keep bringing up or naysaying everything. They're just like really cynical. Jacob. Yeah, I was about to say. Oftentimes, the type of organizational backwardness um, that some people bring, they often have at times of uh, weeding themselves out, yeah. um, especially when you're focused specifically on campaigns of specific types of actions and if it's like not the type of universal that they want yeah. and they're going to be pushing for universal and they're like no one needs to be through these methods these type of people often weed themselves out and uh oftentimes uh, will even corral themselves into organizations where oh, nothing will happen absolutely um and like you said it's kind of the people who are kind of uh, proposing kind of preposterous things um or like when you make a suggestion, they just take it to like an uh, entirely different level. And you're like, uh, yeah, no. And what you do with these people is, like I said, you don't shut them out, you isolate them. And also, um, it's important not to just be like, screw you, you don't know what you're talking about. Because backward people aren't necessarily, like they're not bad people and they're not necessarily doing it because like they're just, like you know they're trying to, um, so you just want to kind of uh, tax tactfully point out why that isn't in the best interest of the organization, why you're not carrying out what they suggested, and why it wouldn't work or won't work in the future. So um, you kind I mean you want to do the what you can and isolate them as best as you can, and then if they're really inflammatory, then just uh, remove them completely. Um, okay, so advanced, intermediate, and backward. Um, and then the goals and principles of debates. This is different from goals and principles of those that you're winning to struggle, because um, with those that you're winning to struggle, it's those that you're trying to bring in, um, whereas the goals and principles of the base are the goals and principles of those within the organization. For example, if you join an anti-war organization, you're probably anti-war. And um, your goals reflect that. And that means as an organization, like let's say I was the head of the, an uh, anti-war organization, then we wouldn't probably want to be focusing our efforts on student work or on immigrant rights. Not because those struggles aren't important, but because as an anti-war uh, group with people in the group that are probably anti-war, um, if you, like, invest a lot of time and effort into those struggles, you're not necessarily reflecting the principles of, of your group. It's like if you, um, they might be anti-war, but they're not necessarily, like they might be like that libertarian person that's like, yeah, no war, but also like all these other things that don't pertain to like, for example, a Marxist-Leninist organization. So just because I'm a Marxist Leninist in an anti-war group doesn't mean I should uh, be trying to promote a uh, Marxist Leninist um, campaigns, which kind of goes back to entryism. But you just have to make sure that as a mass organization, you're representing and pursuing campaigns that reflect the goals and principles of those within the organization. Um, and then who has the most to gain? Um, this is basically what you ask yourself in every campaign. Um, who has the most, the most to gain 
within that, this campaign. Um, obviously, in the Palestinian campaign, it would be Palestinians. Um, and it seems like a very basic question, but you, it's definitely something you want to address um, so that you have a very clear objective going in. Um, so yeah, that's basically um, that. I was thinking that we could just kind of split. Oh, Jacob. Yeah, I was about to say, um, it definitely seems that the primary winners, obviously, of a successful Palestinian campaign is the Palestinians. But also, when doing work in the United States, wouldn't it be just as important for the United States in order to wash its hands of the blood that Israel is creating? Like, Definitely. wouldn't that be like the most broadest appeal that we could get from Americans? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I could see that. I would say Palestinian Americans would gain the most, like obviously Palestinians, but Palestinian Americans living here would gain the most. And then second to that would be like, you know, us, um, because, I mean, the, the, the focus of a campaign is not to feel good about yourself and not to feel like, wow, I've done so much for Palestine, like, yay, I'm awesome. It's like you're actually trying to um, advance, like, that struggle. Greg? I'm kind of unsure of what you're saying. I mean, it sounds like related to something that I often hear and say. Um, and that's to win all that can be won for the people. Yeah. Which, I mean, that seems very specific, like who has the most to gain, right? But we can all win a lot of things. Yeah. Like just education for all. Obviously, it's undocumented students who win the scholarships. But it's also us who say that our school isn't going to be run like a corporation. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, it's us that says the administration has to listen to us. I mean, how do, do, the, do you see those two relating? Or are they no, no, no. I, I completely agree. I definitely think that's. Um, within that. Um, any other questions? Okay, I was thinking we could probably break into the same groups and just kind of discuss um, these points uh, for like a couple minutes, because um, I know it's getting really late. So just get into the group that you were in and just kind of discuss maybe um, what a con like examples of concrete campaigns would and particulars within un the universal and then um, maybe the advanced um, intermediate and backward and how you might identify them. So, which seems like a lot to discuss in my two minutes. So do what you can. What do you guys think about? The same thing as we did last time. Um, I just kind of want to go through each group and hear what you talked about and hear what kind of conclusions you came to. So we'll start with you guys. Um, for the most part, we were talking about with organization is having like a concrete plan, um, you know, like here's what, uh, like for the education for all, like campaign, this is our, our first demand, and if we, when, when we win that, then move on with another demand, win that, then a third demand, until eventually you get like, the things you need. Um, then on the other side that we were talking about, backwards people, um, you know, like, no, uh, noticing who's too extreme or, or, or the polarities of it, you know, who's too timid, but who's yeah. like, no, no, don't do that. Like, God, no, you know? Yeah. But um, that's pretty much it, really. We were talking a lot about Occupy and um, like the Cosmetology <laughs> Program yes. campaign. Yeah, no, I think that you guys brought up an excellent point. Like, when you're uh, designing a campaign or when you're mass organizing, it's really important to pick demands that you like you can win. Um, that doesn't mean settle. That doesn't mean you have to pick like really easy things. But that does mean that you can't just be like, okay, uh, visas for all undocumented students, because obviously that's not going to happen. Um, so you you have to pick things that you you know you can win, um, and then like they said win that and then start like advancing and advance that and every time you win something it's not like yay that's done okay it's always comes back to advancing the struggle correct um and just as a concrete example like i was on the phone call where national sds uh the call was put out from florida and national sds decided every student in america is going to get in-state tuition and financial aid and have an equal right, whether they have papers or not. Um, and that was the decision we made, and as a national organization, we decided that's what we're gonna do, every place in the country. 
And how did we do that? We did it by fighting for concrete things. And literally within six months, Florida, uh, at, because of the leadership of SDS Tallahassee, SDS Gainesville, SDS Tampa, won in-state tuition for undocumented students, um, and now are escalating their campaign. So it, just building off what you said, it's all about having winnable demands, but also not forgetting that like we want the United States to be a country where any student can go to school with in-state tuition and full education rights. Which I think is basically to say that, like, principally, um, right, as it says down here, you principally stand for a uh, struggle. So, yeah, you win these things, but that's not enough, um, which is why you advance your struggle. So first you um, make demands that you can win, and then, like, once you've won those, obviously the demands you can make are that much closer to your overall goal. So, like Greg said, it's very important that you don't lose sight of like what the original struggle is and what your overall goal is. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you go and demand it outright. It's not like, yes, um, in-state tuition or school for every single undocumented person in every single state. Because that's just not, I mean, that's not winnable. So, really good point. You guys. So, uh, we were talking a lot about Occupy as well. Um, and specifically about how like uh, the activity of struggle itself sort of builds builds on itself. Um, and one of the examples, we were talking about how Occupy was very different in different cities, and we were talking about Occupy Oakland, and he was saying that uh, Occupy Oakland turned into this organization, the Oakland Commune, which sort of continued and was a successful organization. And we were saying that's partly because uh, in Oakland, there's more advanced people because of the, the material conditions, um, as well as like the history of politics in Oakland. But also that, uh, like the events, the events of their protests, which were really um, a lot more intense. Like one of this army uh, army veteran uh, died in the in the protests. It made national news. It was a big deal, and they had all these battles with police, and how that sort of probably shaped their organization to be more successful. Um, and then I, I was sort of, uh, I was recently involved in California uh, with a teaching assistant union fight uh, over, we were striking over um, a bunch of labor intimidation, which is illegal. Um, so, and, and in our fight, we also had that similar thing. So I was at UC Santa Cruz, which is the most radical of, uh, of the, the different UC campuses, and they all have their own different characters. So like, for example, when we protest, we, there's two entrances to the school, so we actually block those off. Um, so like uh, autonomous students who are anarchists, but they're awesome, they help us out. We're not allowed to block it off, but they do. And so like, that's very different than at some of the other campuses. Um, but the way like we worked the campaign to, like, so we recently won a new contract and we got concessions on all of our demands, um, some of which were like uh, influence on class size, uh, undocumented uh, student stuff. Uh, we had gender neutral bathrooms. So basically, well, like our strategy was also to build a coalition of like everyone. Like we basically just threw it all in a pot and we're like, we're going to make demands on issues that matter to everyone in this um, in our organization, which is uh, basically a TA union for the, all all the UCs. Um, but really, that the activity of struggle that made it that sort of built up to us winning the contract was we struck in the fall for one day and we're like, okay, and they met our demands for that. They gave us like a 7% wage increase or something. Um, our wages are like behind all the other major research universities. We still get paid a lot, like more than some other um, TAs, I'm sure. But so that that success, we built on that success and then we're like, yeah, we, this is, we won, but we want more, like that's the, Right, like yeah. standing for struggle, not reformism. And so even though it's like a union thing or whatever. Um, and so we struck again for two days, like, you yeah. know, and that, that two day strike, we shut down not just our campus, but we, we, we made a big impact on a lot of other campuses. And so like that, you know, cost them a lot of money. And so sort of that way that, way that you can build on success. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think I thought it was interesting um, that you point out pointed out like the su success of the Open Occupy movement, um, and I think, like you said, part of that is 
because a lot of them were advanced. And like I said earlier, the advanced are the core of your struggle. Um, so when you're going into something, you want to identify and unite your advanced. And if you can do that, um, then your movement has in, like infinitely more potential for success. Um, anyways, you guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So mainly what we talked about, like we just kind of talked a little more about, um, you know, the the advanced intermediate and the um, and the backwards, and the main thing that like you know we ended up talking about how like it's really important to say if there's somebody like chanting like Netanyahu is Hitler or you know, death on Israel, um, at, at one of these rallies, you make sure that, like, you know, you isolate them in a way that other people don't start chanting. So you make sure, like, you know, the, the main, I, you know, I mean, it's kind of implied, I guess, but, like, the main point of isolating the backwards is just to make sure that there's, you know, people aren't going to start to also move towards the back. People are going to want to um, move towards the advance. And uh, I guess I should probably mention we also talked briefly about the Occupy movement. Um, <laughs> And about how, like, you know, there was there wasn't a whole lot of like the I, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of isolating, you know, the backwards um, or identifying the advance. It was more of like a. It, it was very broad, and because of it, they had like a lot of undesirable elements that stuck around for a long time. Like in some cities, they had like problems with like neo Nazis showing up and saying like, oh, all the Jews are one percenters or something, um, and you know something along those lines. And like so, I yeah, I guess we just kind of talked about that really briefly, but that kind of be an example. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, and I think it's, I, I kind of want to point out too that like identifying, I mean, this um, like identification of the advanced intermediate and backward is not like Marxist Leninist being like, we have to find these people and we have to like sort them into little boxes and then use them to their full potential. It's just a matter of being practical. Like, obviously, if you want your uh, movement to be successful, um, kind of using this uh, tactic um, allows you to, like, use everybody to their full potential or not use everybody to their full potential. So it's not like with everything you do, you need to be like, wow, you're advanced, or wow, you're really backwards. It's like, this is just something you can use to make your campaign more effective. Um, and it is, I mean, it's proven useful, but like I said, it's not a moral standing, nor should we like be trying to, it's not just something that um, we're doing to like separate everybody into special categories. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, Occupy is a really great example of the successes and failures that can come from pretty much everything mass organization. Um, the group over there? Uh, we talk a lot about those categories as well. Um, and uh, one member of our group was kind of skeptical about including backwards people in any way mm -hmm. in your organizing. Um, but I talked about how, uh, like, four years ago, I was the most backwards libertarian you can find, <laughs> and I made contact with uh, the uh, UBU RSU, um, and. They uh, really engaged with me and talked with me when I probably deserved to just be eviscerated. Uh, but they, you know, I, I was invited to anti-war protests, which I could get on board with, and it, you know, set me on a path of uh, uh, gaining a better yeah, understanding so. and developing better politics. And Definitely. So I think, yeah, the choosing to. Um, Isolate people who are going to be counterproductive at uh, your events while not totally excluding them yeah. uh, unless you need to uh, yeah, can, definitely. can definitely help build a uh, broader movement. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, and like I said, the backward in one situation and not necessarily the backward in another situation. So if you alienate them out of one movement, then you might be alienating out of them, them out of another movement where they might be an advanced or an intermediate. So you don't want to be like, yep, yeah, screw you, get out of here. Um, for that reason, and then also the reasons you pose. And two, um, 
Like, like we, I said, I think I mentioned this, but about, like with a backwards person, you don't want to be like, wow, you're a terrible person for believing that. It's more like, nope, this is why you're wrong, and this is like why we're right, and not, not necessarily like that, because everybody knows nobody likes being told they're wrong. But you can, you know, point out val like valid reasons and you, um, why why whatever they have to say isn't necessarily true or won't work, Chris. Even uh, more so than just saying you're wrong for reasons X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Why do you think that? It totally. Is a better question. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like Jacob said, a lot of times they'll just kind of like, like when you ask them that or when you confront them with something like that. Um, a backwards person will be like trying to explain and then slowly like, oh wow, why do I think that? Right. Um, why is, if somebody yeah. tells a racist joke, why is that funny? Yeah, exactly. Explain it to me. Yeah. No, I, I think, I, I'm almost, every time I've been con confronted with a backwards person, it's like, so what? Yeah, why do you think that? Or explain that to us in detail. And it usually involves a, oh, I don't know, uh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, that's why you don't necessarily want to um, alienate or just disassociate from them completely. Okay, so, last, um, revolution. Um, and, um, revolution is obviously kind of what you're building with struggle. So, what is the, like, what is the point of struggle, and what is the point of trying to advance struggle? Revolution. Um, and <clears throat> this is, like, in order to get there, once you've achieved all of this, developing, develop, like, continually developing your knowledge and developing new tactics based on what is successful. So it's not just like, this is going to work every single time. You kind of have to address what works and address what doesn't work for certain situations. Like I was talking about with these gentlemen earlier, it's like, well, why don't we do, why don't we do this and that? And I'm like, yeah, we could. Or if that, that I mean, if this current plan doesn't work out, um, we can address it in the future and uh, go from there. Um, we don't necessarily need to um, get everything right the first time. Um, or, and maybe we do get everything right. So there's that. Uh, and then always developing knowledge and always developing theory, which is the entire point of the second half of RSU. You know, we have club business, we organize, we plan, um, and do all of that for an hour, and then, or two hours, which is what it sometimes is, and most today. Um, and then we spend an hour trying to advance our education. Um, and today we're doing mass organizing, but we've done pretty much everything there is uh, out there. We've had a lecture on it, and everyone here is trying to advance their theory. Um, but it's important to note that on that, like being theoretically awesome doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be a great mass organizer, okay? Like you don't, like just because you're some uh, omniscient, like Marxist genius, doesn't, or you can reference some sentence from like Capital Volume Two, um, in the like pay, on page two hundred and eighty nine, doesn't necessarily mean that you are advancing struggle. Um, advancing struggle is about taking theory and applying it practically. Um, so I I can personally vouch that I had a really hard time for, with this for a really long time. Like for I was always like, wow, I don't know. I don't know enough theory, I don't know enough theory. I haven't read Capital all the way through. And you know what? You don't have to read Capital all the way through. Because it's not necessarily about being, like, knowing your theory to a T. It's about being able to learn and educate yourself to theory and then applying that in um, circumstances and applying that to, um, like, why, why was, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. How does that apply to the current circumstances? Um, so, and that's really what's important when you are developing knowledge. Yes, knowledge is great, but how are you going to use this knowledge practically? Um, and then, principally standing for struggle. Principally standing for struggle. 
principally standing for struggle, okay? Struggle is, I mean, it's not, like I was mentioning earlier, it's not just supporting um, Palestine um, or not so condemning Israel, it's condemning imperialism and all, um, and, con and condemning all instances of imperialism um, or condemning institutionalized racism or not just cir certain circumstance circumstances. Um, and then not reformism. And um, I mean, I feel like that's fairly obvious, so I'm not gonna really delve into why reformism isn't a great idea. Um, and then um, avoiding bureau bureaucracy or I, and not avoiding bureaucracy altogether, but trying to um, avoid petty bureaucratic um, discussions or institutional politics. Um, so obviously some things need to be hashed out and some things, um, things need to be assigned, but also we don't necessarily, to refer to our meeting today, need to discuss like what the, like what being a treasurer means. Like yeah, that has its place and all, and cool, but like do we really need to spend an hour talking about it? And how is that advancing struggle? So it happens in every great organization, but, <laughs> but like we just need to learn how to try and avoid it. Um, and like I said, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're like great at it or that we'll always be able to avoid it. But for the most part, we need to try and focus and remain active and dedicated. And in order to do that, we can't just constantly be discussing um, whatever bureaucratic tendencies we have. Um, so discuss that to the point that it is effective and not pass that. Greg? Um, I just have a, a kind of another example um, yeah. because I, I love talking about this person because I despise him so much. Um, it's a, a good example would be Van Jones. Um, he was a communist, he did communist organizing. Um, and then uh, he was like, yeah, I'm going to get a job with the Obama administration. And then he got a job with the Obama uh, administration, and then people found out that he used to be a communist, slash still is a communist, and got fired from the Obama administration. Uh, and now he just runs nonprofits and makes a lot of money and was really comfortably running nonprofits. Um, so like, that's another way in which bureaucracy and institutional politics can kind of suck you in. It's like, oh, I like doing immigrant rights work, so I'm going to go join an NGO. There are plenty of very good NGOs, right? But like, very frequently, uh, people get caught up in like the institution. Like, I would encourage absolutely no one to become a union staffer. Why? Because you're like, I'm organizing for workers. But then, before you know it, what you're doing is you're running around shilling for the Democrats. And you're like, oh yeah, but I work for the SEIU. The SEIU has thousands of members who are workers, so I'm helping workers. And that's why we need to vote for you know the next Democrat in the next election, you know, as it can really suck you in. Whereas, say you're a uh, rank and file uh, union member, then you can fight for contracts, you can mobilize people, and really carry out the sort of mass organizing you're talking about. Yeah, definitely, definitely, that's a really good example. Um, and then, yeah, just, Chris. just really quick on also reformism. Uh, when when the woman was here earlier. She talked about her experiences of trying to reform immigration systems and yeah. became disillusioned and people left and they just didn't work. So it's the idea that you try these channels and these avenues which are you know sanctioned and legal and do things, but then it comes down to taking actual organized actions like letter campaigns, like actual sit-ins and more radical politics. Yeah. So the reforms don't actually work, but your intermediate's gonna see that that through struggle reforms don't work, ergo yeah. something different needs to happen. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, anything else? Um, the last point I want to make is activist organizations versus uh, mass organizations. Um, and um, so the distinction I would make between a um, activist organization and a mass organization. Oh, maybe I don't know where it is. Oh yeah. Um, the difference uh, between an activist organization and a mass organization 
is, um, well, essentially dedication to struggle. But how will you would separate, or, yeah, separate an activist organization from a mass organization is, for example, um, an activist organization is constantly, um, like, constantly um, doing, like, sit-ins and banner drops or uh, disrupting press conferences or holding panels or um, doing a lot of, I mean, a lot of these kind of big mass um, or big movements that bring a lot of people but don't necessarily advance struggle. So activist organizations aren't um, like doing um, like call-ins or they're not necessarily addressing core issues. It's just kind of like, yeah, let's have a, a um, like, what am I, what is the word I'm looking for? A not, a pro, well, essentially, a protest at um, like the tar sands, or let's uh, go camp out at the tar sands, or let's, you know, do this and that, um, which is great and all because, um, I mean, they're doing something, but at the same time, like, are they actively seeking to change le legislation? Are they actively, like, actively um, coming up with campaigns, like long, focused, dedicated campaigns in which they uh, actually seek, um, like they actually have clear demands. And yeah, like um, the tar sands is a demand, like whatever, save the tar, save the tar sands. <laughs> I don't really know what they're doing with the tar sands. Um, but whatever it is, like that's awesome. Um, but like I said, they're not actually chasing to change legislation or going after any of the people involved, um, like contacting organizations and being like, like this needs to stop, or having call-ins, or really doing um, anything other than actively protesting it. Um, which like I said, is good, and I think mass organizations should definitely do all of these things that activist organizations do, but we do all of these things with struggle, and with organization, and with effectiveness, and with clear demands in mind. So, yeah. I was about to say, would you say like maybe one of the huge differences between just merely being an activist organization and a mass organization is mobilizing the intermediate and, and not excluding definitely. them? Definitely. Um, a lot of activist organizations are basically comprised, well, I don't necessarily know if I would call them advanced. Um, but yeah, in that circumstance, uh, advanced, um, but not necessarily mobilize. Yeah, like you said, mobilizing the intermediate. Um, whereas within a mass organization, um, like I, I mean, you have all. I mean, you have clear demands. You set demands that you can meet, and then once you've met those, you keep progressing the struggle. Um, so I think it's just really, I mean, it's important to make the distinction when mass organizing um, between a mass organization and an activist organization. An activist organization is not a bad thing, but they're not necessarily going to be as effective as a mass organization. Um, and also a mass organization kind of takes on a, I would say, a, a like deeper role. Um, like, for example, the. I'm not gonna use the tar sands because I really don't know what that, that's about. Um, <laughs> but anyway, like an activist organization rallies around a certain cause. Um, I would say too, uh, they don't necessarily, like it's, a lot of times they focus on the universal like end racism or more LGBTQ rights as opposed to um, uniting the universal around the particular. So, yeah, that's basically it. Does anybody have any questions or comments on that? Um, on any of it, really? Anybody? Okay. Uh, well, then, I guess, since you're presenting, I'd like to have everyone give Sarah a hand for a wonderful <laughs>